And so the rankings are out, and why not start with Indiana? They are a one seed. Big Ten regular season champions, defensive player of the year, coach of the year in the Big Ten. So dangerous with so many different players who can be a star. Big Ten tournament champions are a two seed. The Iowa Hawkeyes, back-to-back -back tournament champs. They have a player you might have heard of, Caitlin Clark, likely the national player of the year. Going to play home games in Iowa City once again. Speaking of playing home games, Maryland will be playing Friday at home as the two seed taking on Holy Cross. This is the quietest top 10 team in the country. Got better as the season went along. Had four AP top 10 wins this season, the most for the program since the 1970s. And the Ohio State Buckeyes are a three seed. They'll be playing Saturday at home. First time they're in back-to-back -back NCAA tournaments since 2017, 2018. Remember, they started the year 19-0, got ranked as high as number two. They have a press that is designed to destroy the soul of a tourney team with very little time to prepare for it. A few more notes here. The Fighting Illini made it. So did Purdue. That ends some tournament droughts for those two teams. However, they are both in the first four matchups. Also, the Michigan Wolverines came into the Big Ten tournament with a chance to be a top four seed and to host games. Instead, they will be a six seed and will take on UNLV in action starting on Friday. As uh, Dave mentioned, Megan McEwen, my partner, is here with me. And kind of big picture, listen, seven teams in the tournament again. This is five straight years. The conference has had six teams or more. It's an incredible sign of where the league has grown. It just goes to show you year in and year out, the Big Ten continues to be the top notch. Seven teams ties a Big Ten record happened a couple of years ago in San Antonio. But still, some really interesting matchups down the stretch. I was really surprised by a couple of them. We're going to get into it a little bit here. I thought Illinois got shafted, well, well, to, put, to put it lightly. Let's go right there. I mean, going into the Big Ten, tournament this incredible turnaround season they've tripled the wins from last year were ranked in the top 25 just a handful of weeks ago we thought they were an eight seed maybe a nine they barely got in as a first four team and they're playing against a very good team in mississippi state so that's going to be an interesting matchup for the illini from the standpoint of the big 10 was one of the top two conferences across the country this season alone. You saw multiple teams, six, seven, even eight teams at times in the big, in the AP top 25. So the depth that you saw in this league was out of the charge. But for a team like Illinois, who was ranked for the first time since the year 2000, to be an 11 in that play-in game, it's shocking considering the fact that they did win a game in the Big Ten tournament like they needed to in order to continue to prove that they did have a strong enough NCAA tournament resume. They beat Iowa early on in the season. <laughs> Iowa ended up being a two seed. They ended up winning the Big Ten tournament. So to me, it just doesn't make any sense as to why they're in an 11 in a play-in game. Um, I'm not sure what happened there. I agree. It, it's very weird. But I will say the main point is they're in. They're in. That hasn't happened in 20 years in Champaign. So an incredible season for the first year with their new head coach is not done yet. They still got a chance to win some NCAA tournament games. You mentioned the Iowa Hawkeyes. They are the talk of the college basketball world because of Caitlin Clark. But as we all know, it is not just her. But she grabs all the headlines. The strong run in the NCAA tournament, the win in the final game of the regular season against Indiana. A lot of folks, they thought they'd be a one seed as well. Very interesting, too, because you heard some of the committee chairs talking during this election show, and they said that maybe UConn could have potentially been the one to flirt with the one seed, which, again, a little surprising. UConn was not as strong as they normally are in years past. They did win the Big East tournament. And then you see Stanford getting that final one seed. Stanford did lose in the Pac-12 tournament, which was very surprising. So to me, Iowa had itself set up perfectly to be that final one one seed because of how they finished the season, knocking off Indiana, who was ranked second in the country at the time, and then turning around and winning the Big Ten tournament. So in such dominating style, nonetheless, very surprising that they're a two seed. But again, nonetheless, as long as everybody's in, Iowa's going to be hosting. Carver Hawkeye is going to be off the charts for that game. So it's going to be a really interesting tournament. You mentioned winning the Big Ten tournament. It wasn't a Big Ten tournament. It no. was the tournament of the best year the Big Ten has basically ever had in women's basketball. But again, they are a two seed. They will be hosting. Hosting. We mentioned Indiana as a one seed. We'll be hosting their first two games as well. Maryland will host, and I mentioned they're incredibly quiet. They've gotten so much better as the year has gone on. How about Ohio State? The Buckeyes will be hosting, and in case you haven't followed, J.C. Sheldon is the heart and soul of that team. She's been injured the whole year. 
just came back at the beginning of the Big Ten tournament. They're as close to being whole as they've been in a long time. That makes them really scary. Ohio State looked fantastic in the Big Ten tournament, making it all the way to that title game. They ended up losing to Iowa, but J.C. Sheldon is back. Cody McMahon's perhaps playing her best basketball as the reigning Big Ten freshman of the year. And most importantly, this team presses at such a high level that teams aren't necessarily ready for it because they don't face pressing teams all year long. The Buckeyes could potentially make a deep run to the Sweet 16. I like their chances. All season long, there's been a unicorn in Iowa City, and Caitlin Clark has got her Hawkeyes to a two-seed in the women's basketball tournament. They won the Big Ten tournament last week, and now they are sitting pretty with a chance to make the Final Four, which would be such a coup for this program. Here's Justine Ward chatting with the two faces of the Iowa program. Joined now by Lisa Bluter, and Lisa, you're a two-seed. You're taking on southeastern Louisiana. What's your reaction? Just excited to get going again, you know. We're excited to get into the office and start watching film and start preparing this team. But, um, you know, I don't know about much about Southeastern Louisiana University other than that they won the Southland Conference and they had four all-conference players. Um, and so, you know, they've, they've played a good non-conference schedule, including playing at LSU and at Alabama. And you've had a few days to kind of reflect on everything Caitlin Clark has done this season. She's coming off this epic performance in the Big Ten Championship. How do you put that into perspective? You know, I just, I'm fortunate. I'm really grateful that I get to coach a player like Caitlin. Um, I think she's the most exciting player to watch in women's basketball. I think she's the face of women's basketball because of that. And there's nobody that impacts a game more than Caitlin Clark. Caitlin, you just found out you're two seed. You're taking on Southeastern Louisiana. What are your thoughts as you look at this bracket? I think just super excited. I think any time, you know, you have the opportunity to sit there with your team and see your name pop up on Selection Sunday, you know, it's something you always dream of as a kid. You know, I grew up watching this with my family. So, um, you know, I'm super excited. I think, you know, we got a good draw and, you know, you got to be ready for anybody. We certainly know that. But, you know, it's just really, really fun experience for all of us. Obviously an earlier exit than you wanted last year, Caitlin. But what did you learn from that? Yeah, I think to, to be prepared um, at all times. Um, I think it also shows, you know, no matter what seed number is by, you know, our name or whoever, you're, what opponent you're playing, you know, they can do some damage. You can do damage, they can do damage. And I think that's why it makes this the best postseason tournament in all of sport, you know, that there's excitement, there's upsets, you know, there's crazy runs that people didn't see coming. And, you know, that's why it's so fun. And that's why people love watching it. What's top of mind for you as you turn the page to the NCAA tournament? Yeah, I think, like you said, turning the page, you know, you can't get too hung up on being Big Ten champs. Yeah, we'll certainly celebrate that enjoy that we did and we will after the season but I think you know understanding if we want to reach our goals you kind of let, have to let that go in the past our first matchup we'll just focus on that and move forward after that well you look at the last four tournaments for the Hawkeyes and the one that sticks out unfortunately is last year when they were also a two seed but lost in the second round that was a game against Creighton who was a 10 seed it was in Carver Hawkeye and that's been on their mind ever since this past year. Being great, top 10 in the regular season was wonderful. Winning the Big Ten tournament was wonderful. But they've always had this on their mind. Why do you think this year will be different for Iowa? For the third straight year, Iowa has the same exact starting five. This is a team that has a ton of experience. And that same starting five lost in the second round to Creighton last year. So they understand what it's like to be in tournament situations with one another. I've been so impressed with the way this Iowa team has finished the season beating Indiana to end the regular season, going into the Big Ten tournament as the two seed, making it all the way to the final day, and then winning in dominant fashion. Caitlin Clark had a triple-double in that game, 30 points included within that triple-double. It's a team that's playing like a well-oiled machine. Iowa plays with such a quick and pace of play. They rank first in the nation in scoring offense, more than 86 points a game. It is so difficult to find a way to slow them down. The reason why Iowa has been so effective lately is because they have been balanced. Yes, Caitlin Clark can go off for 30 points and you can still beat Iowa. But when you add in Monica Sinano and Kate Martin and Gabby Marshall and Hannah Stolke getting buckets, then that's when Iowa becomes one of the hardest teams to stop because then you have to commit to guarding more than just one person. And that's when things get a little dicey for opponents. I mean, think about Gabby Marshall. Her last nine games, she's shooting 61% from deep. I mean, she's been totally incredible. And they've been incredible at home, too, by the way. 15-1 and one at Carver Hawkeye. They got two games waiting for them there. Now, Real quick, before yes. you change subjects, how many Carver cones are going to get sold during the NCAA <laughs> tournament? That's what I want to know. Many, many, many. Some by you. Uh, <laughs> meanwhile, while we thought Michigan had a chance to be hosting, they are not. They are a six seed. 
The Wolverines will be taking on UNLV Friday in Baton Rouge. It's their fifth straight NCAA tournament, which is a record for the Wolverine program. Here's the head coach, Kim barnes -Arico. We're a really good basketball team. We're a team that was under the radar at the beginning of the year. No one expected that with Nas's graduation. Um, but then we went to some tournaments. We played on the road. We played at Miami. Um, and we challenged ourselves against some really, really good teams. And then, you know, we got banged up. We had a couple things at the end of the year where we we didn't finish exactly the way that we wanted, but we weren't 100 percent either. So this gives us an opportunity these last couple of weeks to get back at it. And I think our our players are feeling excited about the opportunity to con continue to play and in a different role, maybe, you know, be the upset team this year. I know UNLV is a good team in everything, but Michigan feels better than a six. And I don't, I don't say that for anything outside of the fact that they didn't have Layla Filia, and they've got her back. They didn't have Leah Brown their last two games of the regular season, and they've got her back. This is a better team than a six seed. I do think what hurt them in the seeding was that loss to Wisconsin the last game of the year where they did not have Layla Filia, nor did they have Leah Brown. So that's something that I think hurt them regarding dropping to the six line. But that being said, this is still a Michigan team that now has a lot of players who have experience in big time games. I'm thinking about a Jordan Hobbs who had to step up in the absence of Layla Filia, who now has big minutes. Elise Stuck, how good was she big. in the Big Ten tournament big. coming in and providing that type of interior that Michigan needed to be successful? I'm very interested in this matchup with UNLV. The uh, UNLV, by the way, just won the Mountain West Championship game. They have a really great post player uh, who is just fantastic, Desi Ray Young, and she's long, she's strong, she's lean. It's going to be really interesting to see that matchup in the paint. I'm curious to see how an Emily Kaiser and her Cameron Williams can potentially slow her down because that's one of the most physical post players in the country. The incredible job Kim barnes Rico has done in Ann Arbor, Kim, and he summarized in this half of the NCAA tournament wins in the history of Michigan women's basketball have come in the last two years. Isn't that amazing? They went from never making it to now winning consistently in the NCAA tournament. This isn't new territory for them. And Michigan is one of the most disciplined defensive teams as well. And if you're going to commit to the defensive side of the ball, you have an opportunity to make a deep run in the NCAA tournament. And this is a Michigan team that has fantastic ball screen defense. They've been the best at it all season long in the Big Ten. I'm excited to see what if they can make some noise this month. And you see they're playing in Baton Rouge. If they win, they would likely play LSU. You're thinking, boy, that's a tough thing. Remember, last year, LSU lost at home drum, 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 drum. to Ohio State, yep. who is our next team we're talking about as the Ohio State Buckeyes are just fantastic. They are so deep. It's another team that has been battling injuries all season long, but they got J.C. Sheldon back in time for the Big Ten tournament. She maybe wasn't 100% the old J.C. Sheldon, but her energy was there and the way it impacted the team was a big deal. Here's head coach Kevin McGuff. That'll be a challenge for us, and, and I know they'll be excited to be here and, and to, to compete. And like I said, they're used to winning. They're one of those programs that's used to winning, and they've been in the NCAA tournament. Most more years than not, they're in the tournament. So this is nothing new to them. They'll be ready, and so we got to make sure we're prepared for James Madison. I'm really hopeful we can, we can have a great crowd here on Saturday, and I think that would be a really big deal. Again, you think McGuff and the Buckeyes are a team and you watch them, they're so bright. Well, they got brighter when J.C. Sheldon joined. I mean, again, we didn't see the scoring from her that we, we were used to seeing, but the way she adds another level to that press, which as we talked at the beginning of the show, is tough for a team that hasn't seen them all year to get ready for with only a couple days prep. J.C. Sheldon brings excellent motor-wise when it comes to defense, but you talk about her scoring. Her scoring was still impressive right. in the Big Ten tournament. She hit a massive three in some of those tight games to beat Indiana in particular to go to the next round. But having J.C. Sheldon back is massive for the Buckeyes. But I'll tell you what, Cody McMahon, the freshman of the year, I was blown away by her performance in the Big Ten tournament. She is so impressive when it comes to getting downhill. She's six feet tall, but her body is built already like a WNBA player. She's so strong, and her ability to get the ball, she gets so low in her stance when she's driving downhill. It's difficult as a defender, one, to meet her down on the ground, but two, to find their center of gravity to try to just stay in front of her whatsoever. She's so quick. She uses spin moves effectively. I don't know if there are very many teams in the country that have a player quick enough or strong enough to guard her and slow her down. Cody McMahon is going to be the X factor when it comes to the Buckeyes making a deep run. It's also good to have J.C. Sheldon back. And think of this. Uh, behind you is a big old picture of Taylor Mike Sell. 
I mean, we didn't even it get is. to talk about her. I didn't her. talk about her, and she's arguably the best shooter in the country. And so my bad on that, Taylor. How about this for a weird thing, too? If you look at the shaded part up on top, Purdue is there. Ohio yeah. State could have a Big Ten matchup in their second game And of the I don't tournament. like that. I don't like that at all. I don't like that the committee put Purdue in in the same bracket right there with Ohio State with that potential to see them to go to the Sweet 16. It's just, what are we doing? Right. Come there's, on. There should be a way to avoid that. They avoid that on the men's side. There should be a way to 100%. avoid that, at least till either lead eight or sweet 16. Yeah, there are various right. ways that you exactly. can say you can't do anything at some point if teams keep winning, but you can prevent it from the first or second round happening. Mike and Megan back here talking about the Indiana Hoosiers and the amazing Terry Morin. They have the highest seed of any Big Ten squad. They are a one seed. Amazing. Unthinkable a decade ago. And now what Morin has done is incredible. They will play the winner of Tennessee Tech and Monmouth, who have a first four game. Danny Rogers had a chance to catch up with Morin. Coach, your Hoosiers are a one seed, first time ever in program history. What have they done day in and day out to put themselves in this position? Well, they've played really good basketball. Um, you know, this is a group that is um, really tight. Their chemistry is off the charts. Uh, they're certainly talented. Uh, we have balance. We have depth. Um, but uh, what I love about them is that um, every day they come and do the work for us, and they're excited about the opportunity to compete. Uh, we're grateful for this, uh, you know, the, the chance that we have to, to be in the field. It's such a veteran team. They've been here before. They know what it looks like. How much can that carry a team into the tournament? Well, I, you know, you hit it on the head. The experience matters. Uh, and uh, even though we have, you know, seven holdovers from a year ago and seven newcomers, like I mentioned, the chemistry has just been tremendous. But with that chemistry has come age and, you know, the, the maturity uh, of an experienced group. And, uh, you know, we've had a lot of players like the McKinsey Holmes, like the Grace Burgers that have played in big moments. And so uh, I feel like it's going to serve us well. Yeah, I mean, we knew, you know, it's kind of been a historic season for us on a lot of counts. I mean, we knew we were probably going to get, you know, the highest seed in program history. But I think to actually see your name, you know, up there um, with, with some of the best teams in the country. I mean, it's always a surreal feeling and just, you know, that much sweeter that, that we're number one seed. I get why Indiana uh, doesn't get as much attention nationally as Iowa, but they should. They are <laughs> incredible. They are so deep. They got the coach of the year. They got the defensive player of the year. And the math says if you're a one seed, your odds of making a final four are just way better than if you're a two. And when you saw that bracket come out, you said very quickly, I really like their draw. Indiana, to me, has been a Final Four team since January. They have proven it day in and day out that they are not only the best team in the Big Ten, but one of the best in the country because of how disciplined they are, especially on the defensive side of the ball. This is an Indiana team that I think drew really well in their bracket. LSU is a three seed in this region. That could be an interesting matchup down the line. I tell you what, Villanova... Indiana potentially in the Sweet 16. Be fun. Could Maddie be Segrest. a lot of fun. Maddie Seacrest, for those who do not know, has been putting up better numbers than Caitlin Clark has when it comes to points per game. Right. She leads the nation in scoring for Villanova. A fantastic player in the Big East. But Indiana still has to get past the winner of Oklahoma State, Miami. Obviously, the winner of Tennessee Tech, Monmouth. But I just think that Hoosiers are primed to make a deep run. They have the inside presence of Mackenzie Holmes, which already causes problems for teams because she's 6'3 and has the footwork of a goddess. And then you have that outside <laughs> shooting ability that Sarah Scalia brings to the table, Sydney Parrish, Chloe Moore McNeil. And then, by the way, while we're going to talk about Chloe Moore McNeil, one of the best defenders in the Big Ten, constantly taking the assignment of the best player on the scouting report. It's a team that's deep, and it's a team that knows how to make deep runs because they have that mindset of, hey, we have unfinished business. Yes, we won the Big Ten regular season title. They feel a little slighted that they got bounced early in the Big Ten tournament. This is their chance to make history. One of the best defenses in the country, now one of the best offenses mm -hmm. in the country. Six different players who could offensively take over a game. They have an absolute great shot at the Final Four. Now, they're not the only team in the Big Ten that, of course, has a great shot at the Final Four. We mentioned Iowa as well. We mentioned Ohio State. How about the Maryland Terrapins? <laughs> Coach Freeze getting up first. Four top ten <laughs> wins this season for Freeze and the Terps. And here's what the head coach had to say when she talked with Christy Winter Scott. Coach, number two seed in the Greenville location for the regionals. When you started this season with nine new players, only one returning starter in Diamond Miller. Flash forward to right now, discuss all of the 
work that went into getting to this point. Yeah, pinching myself and uh, it was a lot of work behind the scenes first and foremost with our staff I can't say enough and then our players for the buy-in and you know this ultimately was a goal first and foremost was to, to be able to host I mean to give yourself an advantage hopefully and then uh, you know love our bracket but um, a lot of unknowns way back when but really proud of to be a two seed and be just standing here. Diamond Miller, the only returning starter. How important has it been for her to be mature competitively this season for your team? Diamond has become the ultimate leader for us. And, you know, just to see that growth and that maturation. And again, she's a player that had to really trust what was around her with so many new uh, teammates and learning their their strengths and their weaknesses. But um, she, she led the way and, you know, is a big reason why we are where we are today. It just is a part of the journey. You know, you start as a freshman and now I'm a senior. So, I gradually worked my way up to being a leader, so I'm just super excited and living in the moment, that's for sure. What kind of advice do you give the players who have not yet yeah. competed in the NCAA tournament? Be poised. There's going to be a lot of times where teams go on runs and you kind of feel that pressure like, oh my gosh, my season is over. But just remember there's a lot of time on the clock and you got this. Diamond Miller is a player who could explode in this NCAA tournament. Oh. And, I mean, she's already made a name for herself, but she could absolutely take over this tournament. And and Brenda would hate me looking ahead, but we're not coaching the team, so we're allowed to look we're allowed ahead. To do that, yeah. When you look at their bracket, you're thinking, okay, they're the two seed. Their one seed is South Carolina. That's obviously dangerous. They're the number one overall seed for a reason. They played each other this year without Diamond Miller. It was a big win for South Carolina, 25 points, but the best Terp wasn't even in that game. Which is unbelievable to think about at this point in time. I've been so impressed with the way that Maryland has come on as of late, and they've shown some depth as they've gone down the stretch. Here's what's been so impressive is the emergence of Lavender Briggs and Brene Alexander, two transfers that came in. They've been in and out of the starting lineups. Coach Freeze has had to take some time to really find the chemistry and the lineups that she wants, but now she's been able to, and as a result, this team has started to roll. I really like Maryland's draw, and I like the way their bracket is set up. I think they have a really good shot at getting to the Elite Eight, where they would potentially face South Carolina, the overall number one seed in this tournament, to go to a Final Four. But if Maryland can play at the level which we saw against Iowa in the regular season, the second matchup where they beat the Hawkeyes by 30, they played tremendous defense. KYP, know your personnel. That means locking into the scouting report. When the Terps can do that at a high level, that's when they became really dangerous. Well, and we mentioned with Indiana, the reason they're so impressive is the multiple players who can score and the experience. And you started alluding to that. Remember, Maryland had all that turnover in mm -hmm. the offseason, but the transfer they brought in including Abby Myers the Ivy League player of the year last year you mm -hmm. mentioned Brene Alexander like they brought in players who have been experienced in college ball previously Abby Myers especially was the Ivy League player of the year last season for Princeton which is a team also that is a key defensive team a year ago led the uh, nation in defensive points per game but you have just experience now, and it's a team we talk about peaking at the right time. Maryland has started to come together into February, into March. You saw the little bit of a run they were able to take in the Big Ten tournament. I've got a lot of faith in what the Terps can draw up coming forward, not to mention Brenda Fries, one of the best coaches in the country, especially when it comes to making in-game adjustments. Back-to-back -back sweet 16s for Fries and the Terps. Meanwhile, Purdue is a program that is being rebuilt thanks to Katie Geralds, and they have been fantastic. They are back in the NCAA tournament for the first time since 2017. They are an 11 seed. They will play in the first four against St. John's. Here's Geralds. When Illinois came in as a playing game, uh, knowing that they finished sixth, we finished seventh in the league, uh, then you... You know, you see Miami, you see West Virginia, some other bubble teams getting thrown up in there. Um, it was a, a very long 25 minutes for me. Uh, on paper, resume looked solid. Um, not playing the Michigan State game uh, just because their net was higher than us. Uh, not having the opportunity to play that game impacts numbers and all that. Uh, not playing the Campbell game. Uh, but at the same time, like, here we are and uh, we get a chance to play basketball in March. And they'll play basketball against St. John's, which is a low-scoring team. They only average 65 points a game this season. But kind of the, the big picture with Purdue is they are back. And even though we thought 11 seed might be a little low for them, they are in the tournament in just year two of this turnaround. Credit Katie Gerald. She's done a fantastic job with a Purdue team, which quite honestly – 
we weren't sure what they're going to look like cut into the season, she, but she gets those players to buy in, and they play so hard. And having a player like Abby Ellis, who was coming off the bench to start the season, now in the starting lineup, she's just been tremendous down the stretch with her scoring ability at three levels. You have Cass Harden, who's able to knock it down from three. Just so many different players that are key on that team to make it a run. It's interesting to hear Coach Gerald's talk about, you know, what could have happened if they rescheduled that Campbell game, that Michigan State game, because those do factor into what the committee sees when they look at the final resume and how many wins you have. But St. John's, to your point, beat UConn earlier in the season. It's a really good Big East team. Many said they were a bubble team that could potentially get in at large, as you see this does come to fruition. Uh, but like you mentioned, don't score a lot of points. They're defensively really, really strong. Curious to see how that matchup's going to face up. And then you got to turn around and play UNC. In the beginning, we're rolling. But keep in mind, Michigan did beat North Carolina earlier this year. But still, it's a team with a ton of ACC experience, which is always one of the top conferences in the country. And as we mentioned earlier, if they win that game, they likely would have Ohio State in the second so round. So random. In Columbus. Come on. Ohio. By the way, something else for Purdue to keep in mind. 9-1 and one in the non-conference. Mm -hmm. This year, only one loss when they weren't playing Big Ten competition. Well, one of the biggest stories in women's basketball for the Big Ten all year long is the incredible turnaround Shauna Green has done in her first year in charge in Champaign. She's got them in the NCAA tournament for the first time in 20 years. They're in the first four, taking on Mississippi State Wednesday in South Bend. If they win that one, they got six seed Creighton waiting for them. Telly Hughes caught up with the head coach of the Orange and Blue. Illinois in an 11 seed in the Greenville Regional. Head coach Shauna Green joins me to break it all down. Coach, first off, congratulations making the tournament in your first season as the Illinois head coach. No, thank you so much. We're excited to, to have this opportunity. All right, you playing Mississippi State. What do you know about your opponent, and how quickly do you get on this scouting report? Yeah, I mean we're going. We're we'll <laughs> head right over to the office after this and, and get to work. So and and with playing on Wednesday, obviously we got a we got a quick turnaround. So we'll probably be there all night tonight and, and working on that and, and getting that re scouting report done. And you know Mississippi State, obviously they have a first year coach uh, there as well. And we played them last year when I was at Dayton. We played Mississippi State, so some of the same players are there. Um, and I've watched them a few times, but obviously. So you gotta got to break down a lot more uh, in the next couple days. 22 wins. You have built a winning culture here so far in your first season. With this team, what makes it unique to possibly make a deep run in this tournament? You know, I think that a lot of people may even, you know, look over us and, and, and think that, you know, hey, they haven't been here before. So, um, and that's fine, you know, but this team, they've always believed through from day one when we took take, uh, took this program over, they they believed that we could achieve this and, and they just continue to work. They continue to get better. So uh, there's no doubt this team will be ready to go and ready to compete. They surpassed last year's win total by the first week of December. They doubled last year's win total by the first week of January, and they enter the NCAA tournament having tripled last year's win total. And yet somehow they're in the first four, which we still can't quite fully understand. I feel like they got snubbed, especially when you look at how good the Big Ten was year, like from top to bottom. That huge win over Iowa in, in January by Illinois, I thought really helped boost their resume. They took Ohio State down to the wire. They were up 17 at one point at home That's against right. Ohio State. The Buckeyes did come back to win that game. But Illinois has proven day in and day out that they truly belong in this field of 68. But my question is, how do you have them in a play-in game when their resume was so airtight headed in to this tournament? But you know what? It is what it is. The committee made their decision, and here we are. But look, to turn around and play Creighton, I think, first off, this Mississippi State game is going to be interesting. It'll be a close game. But the Illini have so much firepower between their backcourt with Mekhi Cook, Adalia McKenzie, Genesis Bryant, that I do think it's a winnable game for them. Then you turn around and play Creighton, who's one of the best teams in the Big East. And again, I do think when those big three guards are on point, they're so difficult to defend because they're small and they're quick. And not a lot of guards in the conference – match up well against them. We saw Michigan effectively guard Illinois earlier this year playing a zone because they used their length because they knew they didn't have that quickness advantage. Uh, but I'm just curious down the stretch how teams are going to choose to guard the Illini in this tournament. And even though it feels confounding to you and I that they're somehow an 11 seat, they're still in the NCAA they tournament. They are, they are. And they haven't done that since literally 20 years ago, 2003. Their turnaround has been one of the great stories for the Big Ten this year. The very top of the Big Ten is really what, where the spotlight shines the brightest. Four teams will be top four seeds, which means they will be hosting games in the NCAA tournament. That's the exact same amount they had last year. And they, by the way, 
teams that are hosting are really good. Like, we didn't get a chance to mention this. Indiana was 16-0 and at home this year. Well, fantastic crowds are going to be seen across the country, which is really exciting for the Big Ten. But I really think you have two or three teams in this tournament coming up that have a really good bracket that could potentially make a deep run in this tournament. Indiana, I think, has a really favorable side of the bracket, as does Maryland, as does Iowa. You're going to have some teams that are going to be able to pull together some deep runs. And, hey, who knows what you're going to see from a team like Illinois or Purdue in a play-in game. You never know. You can't count anybody out in March because there's just a little bit of magic that happens over the course of the next couple weeks. I still think that Ohio Ohio State Press is going to be jarring. I don't want to play against it. I still think Michigan is not a six. Mm -hmm. That's going to be a tough matchup for whoever they have as well. The final four comes your way March 31st in Dallas. Big Ten teams are fighting for that. Not all of them, however. The Nebraska women's team just missed out on making the NCAA tournament. They will be in postseason basketball playing in the WNIT.